Hello, I am Gunnar Donger, the Vice President of PASS, and we are here with Eric Shiner, who is a curator, historian, and art industry veteran. I was wondering, uh, to start off, if you wanted to talk a bit about your background and your journey from Pennsylvania Horse Farm to New York City. Yeah, um, thanks for having me, first of all, and pleasure to meet you, and hello to everyone watching. Um, my life makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I grew up um, just outside of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which is um, a small city, to say the least, of about 19,000 people, an hour north of Pittsburgh. And my family was in the candy business. We had a chocolate factory and a couple of retail stores, and we also happened to have a horse farm. I realized very quickly through mostly the lens of MTV that there was a much wider world um, beyond my um, immediate environs. And I quickly became very enamored with all things New York City. I was very fortunate to go the first time when I was 13 and completely um, became enwrapped with all things New York. And um, Andy Warhol, of course, through his appearances on MTV, my first introduction to Warhol um, seemed very alluring and intriguing. Um, I was very fortunate, fast forward, um, upon graduation from the University of Pittsburgh, where I went as an undergraduate with a double major in art history and Japanese, um, to be given the opportunity to be the first curatorial intern at the Andy Warhol Museum, which was opening mere weeks after graduation from college, um, which was very good for me in that I studied 16th century Japanese screen painting and castle architecture in college, which meant there weren't a lot of job opportunities available to me. I'm sure many of you will <laughs> um, be facing similar odds upon graduation um, from Stanford. But um, for me, this opportunity was absolutely the right thing to jump into. And I started work at the museum the week that we opened to the public and worked there for an entire year, um, assembling an Andy Warhol chronology, reading every book I could get my hands on, on Warhol. And that really provided the foundation of what would later be my career. But I was also still very intrigued by Japan. And I started to look at what um, Japanese artists were doing through the lens of Andy Warhol. And I quickly shifted my academic focus to post-war Japanese art and art history. Um, ultimately, I moved back to Japan and matriculated at Osaka University, where I did my master's degree, um, looking at gender transformation and masquerade, um, mostly um, looking at the work of Yasumasa Moimura, a great Japanese contemporary artist, and um, did that for three years. And upon graduation, um, became the assistant curator of the first ever Yokohama Triennale in 2001, which was a wide scale um, show of about 106 artists from all over the world. My section um, had 26 artists and I worked with one of Japan's great curators, Shinji Komoto, um, as his assistant. And we put together that show, which premiered in um, the fall of 2001. Um, and basically at that point, I needed to decide if I was going to stay in Japan or come back to the States. Um, and I was very fortunate to be accepted into the PhD program at Yale in art history and decided to come back to the States, moved to New Haven from Tokyo, did that for two years. And to make a long story short, in 2004, Asian contemporary art exploded in New York City and all of a sudden I was being asked to curate, to write, to teach. And I decided to do the unthinkable and I dropped out of my PhD program and moved to New York. I know shock, gasp, I'm a beauty school dropout and moved to New York City and started to curate and to teach and to write and to do all of the things that I was so passionate about doing um, anyway. And um, did that for four years, looking at both Japanese contemporary art, Chinese contemporary art as well. And um, strangely, one day in the summer of 2008, I got a call from the Andy Warhol Museum asking if I would be interested to move back home and become the chief curator um, of the museum and of course I said yes. So I moved back to Pittsburgh um, literally the day the economy crashed in 2008 which was a very good dodging of bullets um, and became the Milton Fine curator of art at the Warhol 
did that for a little bit over two years and our then director decided to retire and I was asked if I would be the acting director. I said yes and very quickly became the full director and was there for a total of six years. And it was so wonderful and such an honor to be able to go back to where I started and also to promote Warhol in incredible and dynamic new ways. Um, we grew attendance, my team and I, from 105,000 when I started to over 150,000 people a year, which in Pittsburgh is quite a good number. Mm -hmm. And also taking Warhol Global. So we sent Warhol shows all over the world, did a huge retrospective tour of Asia um, that went to Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, and Tokyo. And um, a number of other venues all over the world. And um, was having a wonderful, wonderful time doing that. And then all of a sudden I got a phone call from Sotheby's asking if I would consider being an executive in the contemporary art department to sell contemporary art. And obviously being one that is not risk adverse or afraid of taking on new challenges, I decided to dive right in. So I moved back to New York City and entered the commercial art world, which I did for a total of a little bit over three years um, at both Sotheby's. And then I became um, the artistic director of White Cube, the contemporary gallery from London, um, running its New York operations until the um, voices of the, con the contemporary nonprofit world started to call my name again. And um, as of January 6th, I became the um, first executive director of Pioneer Works, an amazing dynamic nonprofit in Brooklyn in the Red Hook neighborhood that looks at art, science, technology, music, and all facets of creativity equally and together so that we can all think about the world that we want to inhabit going forward. So my idealism won out in the end and I'm now back doing truly what I love. Wow. I'm wondering what that experience was like. Um, you know, was there anything that prompted you to want to exit from the art business side and enter into the nonprofit sphere? Was there just something about Pioneer Works that intrigues you? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of all of those things combined. But um, Dustin Yellen, who is the founder of Pioneer Works, who is an amazing contemporary artist, has been a friend of mine for over 15 years. So I've seen Pioneer Works in all of its iterations from a blank shell through a growing organization to the great um, powerhouse that it is today. So it was very intriguing for me to be a part of that conversation and also to help grow it to the next level and take it to the next level. And as far as the commercial world goes, I actually enjoyed it. I was good at it, but I also realized that it was um, you know, jokingly the hamster wheel of death in that it continually goes and goes and it grows. So the number that is attached to you um, in terms of what your selling quota is for the year grows, of course, exponentially every year. And I realized it would only continue to grow and the keeping that many balls in there was not exactly what um, brings me solace and joy in life. And I always want to make sure that art makes a true societal change, that it has an impact that matters, that affects real lives in real time. And that was that voice that was calling me back to the nonprofit sphere. And luckily I'm able to do that now at Pioneer Works. So you knew Dustin Yellen from before, and it seems like a lot of these uh, curation opportunities were sort of extended to you. Was that a byproduct of knowing all these people in the right places or? Well, Absolutely. And one's network is just so critically important. And, you know, as all of you go into your careers in the art world, it's so important to stay a part of the conversation and to make sure that you have something interesting to say and that you can um, add to the conversation and not simply um, be there. Um, even though that sort of worked for Warhol, I guess he was the great voyeur who was off to the side watching. So you can do that, too. But um, it's really important just to make sure that you have a, a group of friends, of associates that you can trust, you can rely on, and that you grow together as you navigate the art world, simply because it is such a huge organism 
now. It was a much different world when I started and certainly a much different world 20 years before that. Um, it will certainly be interesting to see how the art world emerges from the current situation that we are in. But really having a cohort of um, contacts, a network um, is so critically important because that's who you depend on as you grow, as you make connections. Um, and that's how things start to unfold as um, your career unfolds. I'm wondering, so you had sort of your cohort in, in New York and then in Pittsburgh and then also in Japan. Yep. I'm wondering what role location plays in this because I've heard you have to be in New York, but you've had experiences all over. Yeah, I would definitely disagree with the have to be in New York thing because New York certainly is one aspect of the contemporary art world and it is the major player thus, but there are certainly lots of other major spheres of influence the world over, and that includes all areas of the world, South America, Africa right now is so dynamic, and there's so much wonderful work happening in Africa that needs to be paid much more attention to, and certainly many other spheres of influence the world over, and I think that anyone um, who wants to be successful in today's age needs to have um, a truly global perspective. And many people are saying that with the current crisis as example, that we may be going back to a more regional economy, a more regional network. But the art world, I think, will always remain in that global skein, if you will. And it's very important to make sure that you're um, conversant and fluent in that truly global art language. And I'm wondering about your experience, you know, really being at the center of that, uh, when the Asian art market really took off. Yeah, because obviously you were in Japan and then you were in New York. What was it like just observing that and being a part of it? It was so exciting. And to be honest, it was completely unbelievable because there were so few of us working in that sphere at the time. Um, this being the early to mid 90s. And as things started to unfold into the late 90s, a few artists started to be paid more attention to, namely Takashi Murakami and Yoshitomo Nara. Kusama Yayoi was starting to be taken seriously after decades of living in near anonymity, which was insane. I met her when I was, I think, 24 years old and she took a meeting with a 24 year old kid which um, goes to show that not a lot of people were calling at the time but um, and the same with Chinese artists Xu Bing and Ai Weiwei and Tsai Guo Chang were all starting to play in the international sphere appearing at the Venice Biennale things like that and all of a sudden in the early 2000s it was starting to be taken more seriously and more people started to pay attention to it um, and in 2004, all of a sudden, that's what everybody really wanted. So it was boiling for, you know, a decade at least. But when it actually broke, there were still very few of us that were in the trenches and fluent in the languages and fluent in the cultures um, that, you know, is so critically important to fully understand where things are coming from. And um, it was really, really great to see the world taking it seriously, finally after a lot of hard work on a, you know a dedicated group's behalf and um it sadly was not as long lived as many of us would have wanted to see because the uh, economic crash of 2008 mm -hmm. took many of those artists and much of their work and their um, voices away with it and um i think that soon the world will be looking again to Asia as a true source of really ingenious production because it's decidedly still the case. Art Basel Hong Kong was canceled due to COVID, um, shifted to an online format. Um, I'm wondering about the role that art fairs play in terms of uh, establishing the market across the world, but now also, you know, the internet and if things are moving to an online format, does that even matter? Uh, I think it does matter, certainly. And art fairs are, for me, a very love-hate relationship in that they are incredibly useful in terms of having the art world, in scare quotes, descend at, 
one time in one place. So it's very useful in terms of having meetings and growing your network and meeting new people and making things happen. That's incredibly useful, just as from the point of view of exposure, it allows one to see what is happening, what is in vogue at any moment in time. And it's in that sense, one stop shopping in that you get to see a lot over the course of just a very few days. So it's very useful, but the bad side of that equation is the fact that there are now too many art fairs. There are over 50 major art fairs in the world, a lot more than that if you add all of the satellite fairs, which means that if you want to play that part of the game, one would have to literally be living on an airplane flying city to city to city, which takes one away from a core notion of being an essence and all of a sudden you become like an itinerant salesperson. Um, so it's actually not thinking about that. It's not too different from the old Fuller brush salesperson that would go door to door and sell his wares. Um, it sort of becomes something like that. If anything, I hope that it scales back and that it's much more about quality um, over quantity. I think we would be perfectly okay if there were only five or six art fairs in the world scattered across continents. Um, there are six inhabited continents. Maybe we could just do six art fairs, one per. That would be okay. And you could do them every like two or three years and not have to be living on airplanes as much. And, um, you know, you bring this up about digital sales rooms. For savvy art collectors who are in the know, who are very used to the aesthetics of um, this sphere, and also who know the work of the artists they collect, to the degree that they're comfortable looking at an image and having a full sense of what it would look like in real life is perfectly okay. However, for anyone else, either new to the game or exploring a new artist, I've always said, and I will always continue to say, that seeing an artwork in person is critical to fully understanding it. It is nearly impossible to fully understand the operations, the mechanics of a painting unless you are standing in front of it. Does it have brush strokes? Is it flat? These are things that tend to disappear, although of course technology is now allowing us to get into the very granular pixels of a work of art, but it's not the same as standing in front of it. So I always advise people, if you're going to make a major investment in a major work of art, make sure you see it in person first. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the online sales platform continues into the future, but I do hope that we always have the ability to see things in real time, real space. The same goes for museums. Of course, almost every cultural institution right now is figuring out ways to share content digitally over their online and social media platforms, which is fantastic, but it never replaces being in front of the actual work of art. And I look very forward to the day when we can all return to our museums and our cultural institutions and have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, that interaction to gather together and to celebrate. Hopefully that's soon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. Um, you've spoken a bit about you know, the relationship one has with the work of art. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship with you and an artist, especially if you're collecting. It's a really good question and just like anyone's specific personality, you have to do what is comfortable for you and you have to buy what you respond to. And any salesperson in the art world is very good at convincing you at exactly why one should acquire a specific painting or sculpture or print or photograph. They are very good at crafting the narrative as to why this belongs on your wall. But everyone just needs to take a step back and realize that these objects are the life's work, the passion, the soul of an artist in either two, three, or now virtual dimensions. And that someone put a lot of time, effort, and thought into um, their artistic um, vocabulary, what they want to say, why they want to say it. And by acquiring this object, it becomes part of your life 
part of your narrative and part of your family, if you look at it that way. And you're going to be living with this object and hopefully many other objects um, in your daily life. And what does that work say to you? Is it something that you can go back to again and again? Will it always remain fresh? Will it always challenge you? Will it always bring you inspiration or joy? Or does it make you cry? Does it have an emotional connection to you? I think that's the most important thing that every piece of art that you bring into your world has that emotional connection to you. And that will be so much more important long-term than the financial value of the work. Now, of course, one can make smart decisions in terms of what one responds to and then buys so that it may one day go up in value. And I think true collectors are the ones that are always very, very perplexed when something becomes so financially valuable that they have to start considering letting it go and that pains them <laughs> to the point that they really question, would I rather have this work that is so important to me or would I rather have $10 million? Which is a very hard judgment call in those cases when that actually happens, which is of course rare. But um, it's really just about buying things that you respond to, that you love, that you have that connection with. And I don't think you can go wrong if you follow your heart in that sense. What you specifically look for in a work of art, and if there's any artists right now that are really jumping out at you and catching your eye. Yeah, when I buy art, which I buy way too much art, and anyone that does will tell you that of course it is a disease that will never go away. Um, it is an addiction, but it's certainly better than most addictions and that it does always allow you to be surrounded by things that excite you and stimulate your thinking and your mind. So I tend to collect in a few categories. I love works of art that incorporate text. Um, obviously Japan plays a role in what I collect. I happen to collect work that revolves around animals and nature. Maybe that's that farm thing growing up. Um, and I also collect portraiture. So those tend to be the overarching categories within which I um, collect and that I respond to. I also try to always give preference to women artists and artists of color um, whenever humanly possible. And that's important to me as well. To live with diverse voices is something that brings me joy and certainly something that I've dedicated my profession to, making sure those voices, different voices, radical voices, are heard. So it makes sense that I'd want to live with this cacophony of voices as well. And um, that's what fuels me. And I try to buy less simply because I have very little wall space or floor space anymore but still i'll occasionally walk into a gallery or to a fair and see something that i just absolutely fall in love with and figure out how to um, bring it home with me um, so i think that you know those are the overarching parameters but there is always room for um, a diversion and um, eclecticism i think is the overarching rule um, and everything that I collect, whether it be antique furniture, mid-century modern design, you name it, I love to mix things up. And that is the world that I inhabit. For a young art student or a student interested in the arts, do you have any general words of advice? General I have words. lots of advice for art Even students. That. And it is one of my great um, joys to share ideas and um, thoughts with art students especially. And, you know, I always start off with Andy Warhol. It's sort of my default, but it makes sense. Um, Andy was really, really good at being memorable. And I think that any artist that succeeds in her or his own way or their own way um, is memorable. And it really is about developing a look, a vibe, a presence, so that you're remembered and you are very instrumentally tied to your artwork. And if you think about the great artists that we remember and talk about today, 
whether it be Georgia O'Keeffe or Duchamp or Picasso or Van Gogh, Warhol, etc., they all had a persona that was as important to their art making as the art itself. And these things are intertwined. So I always think it's very important to determine your persona, your look, your vibe, and live that as though it was just as important as the work that you make, so that they're intertwined. That when someone sees you, they see your work, and they're inextricably bound to each other. Now, that's easy enough if you're um, an extrovert or an A-type personality who is perfectly okay being in front of your work, in front of the camera. Um, I know many people are not, many people are introverts, and many artists especially are introverts. So how do you create an alluring persona that wants people to try to find out more, to try to crack the code? So if you are an introvert, figure out how to use that to your advantage as well. Make yourself harder to crack, harder to find out, um, and um, try to be an enigma, a mystery, that people are always trying to figure out who you are, be mysterious, and be alluring. Now, of course, that has to fold into your artwork as well in figuring out that connection. But in addition to this persona that you create, there are other ways to be memorable. And I think one of the best things that you can do, especially as you're starting off trying to meet curators, trying to meet people who are able to promote your work, a gallerist, a writer, do something that leaves a mark. And that can be a handwritten note, it can be a drawing, it can be a handmade book. This is what Warhol did, he would always leave behind a hand printed or hand stamped and hand colored booklet of his images with every editor, every creative director, everyone he went to see, he would always leave this little memento behind. And it sat there and brought people joy. And they thought, wow, this is really incredible. And it also allowed them to remember Andy so that they would think he made that extra effort, took that extra step so I'm going to hire him because he stood out from the pack. And you might think that's really hard to do, but it's not at all. And it's very easy to just have something that you send, a little handmade something, it doesn't have to be valuable, and send that as your calling card. And it works wonders and really allows you to stand out, be memorable, and it's only natural that someone would want to support someone who made that extra effort in life. So it's really just about figuring out truly who you are and what your work is and what it is going to say to the world. Finding your tribe, of course, is very important. Finding your network, um, making sure that it's supportive and that people are helping each other and being your true self and making that um, true self shine. Easier said than done, but that's the that's the mix